Hey, good evening and welcome to tonight's event. Iran and Current Events, which is part of this year's Chastain Johnston Middle Eastern Studies Lecture Series. Thank you all for coming. I am Kelly Shannon, Associate Professor of History and the Chastain Johnston Middle Eastern Studies Distinguished Professor of Peace Studies here at Florida Atlantic University. I'd like to thank our co-sponsor, FAU's Peace, Justice, and Human Rights Initiative, I'd also like to thank FAU's College of Arts and Letters, without whom programming like this is not possible. Our guest tonight is Barbara Slavin, director of the Future of Iran Initiative and a senior fellow, a non-resident senior fellow at the Atlantic Council. Slavin is also a lecturer in international affairs at George Washington University. The author of the book, Bitter Friends, Bosom Enemies, Iran, the US, and the Twisted Path to Confrontation, she is a regular commentator on US foreign policy and Iran on NPR, PBS, and C-SPAN. A career journalist, Slavin previously served as assisting managing editor for world and national security for the Washington Times, senior diplomatic reporter for USA Today, Cairo correspondent for The Economist, and as an editor at the New York Times Week in Review. She has covered such key foreign policy issues as the US-led war on terrorism, policy toward rogue states, the Iran-Iraq war, and the Arab-Israeli conflict. Slavin has traveled to Iran nine times. She also served as a public policy scholar at the Woodrow Wilson International Center for Scholars, where she wrote her book, Bitter Friends. She was also a senior fellow at the US Institute of Peace, where Slavin researched and wrote the report Mullahs, Money, and Militias, How Iran Exerts Its Influence in the Middle East. Now, tonight's event will function a lot like a talk show. I will ask our guests several questions to kick off tonight's conversation, and then we will open up the floor to audience questions. To ensure that everyone who is in the audience can hear the speaker, please make sure that you have your microphone on mute unless you are actively speaking. Uh, and just as a reminder, tonight's event will be recorded and posted to the FAU website. So um, Barbara, I would like to thank you for being here with us and uh, for sharing your expertise. You're one of the leading experts on present day Iran. So I'd like to start out by asking you how you became interested in Iran and how you first traveled to Iran to develop your, your profile now that you're the, the head of the Iran Futures Initiative at the Atlantic Council. Sure, first of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's, it's, it's always a pleasure and an honor uh, to speak to folks about this issue. Uh, I am very much an accidental Iran expert. I was a Russian major in college and uh, subsequently was a journalist in China as it was opening to the West. But Iran fell into my lap. And, and here there's an interesting uh, 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 juxtaposition, I guess, with the news that we've been getting from Afghanistan. The reason I went to Iran for the first time in 1996 was because of the Taliban. They had just consolidated power in Afghanistan and we were getting stories about uh, their terrible treatment of women in particular. And my editor at the time at USA Today said that I should maybe do a comparative piece on the status of women in the Muslim world. So I said, okay, let me go back to Cairo where I had lived for four years in the 1980s. And I said, why don't I go to Iran? You know, I've heard it's a really fascinating country and that the people are nothing like the stereotypes and it would be a good, it would be a good comparison. It's also a bo on the border with Afghanistan. So I approach uh, um, someone at the UN mission, Iran's UN mission, and they were thrilled at the idea because they thought they had a good news story to present. And in a way they did. I mean, there's obviously discrimination against women in Iran, but nothing on the order of the way the Taliban uh, certainly behaved at the time. Women in Iran were going to universities, they were driving cars, they were serving in most, prof most uh, professions. And uh, so they, had a, they thought they had a, a, you know, a PR <laughs> opportunity. Um, anyway, I went to Iran for the first time in 1996 and I, I simply uh, found it fascinating. The politics were Byzantine, very much sort of like, you know, Soviet, politics in a way, uh, who's up, who's down, different factions, a kind of politburo, except instead of a communist party, you had the ruling clerics. Uh, 
Um, and every time I went back, there was more and more uh, to cover. I think what also grabbed me, at least in the 90s, was that Iran appeared to be on a trajectory toward reforming the system. And there was also a very active debate on whether there should be a restoration of relations with the United States. Um, now, things have not turned out as I would have hoped, and there have been lots and lots of ups and downs in the relationship, obviously, since then. Uh, but, but it was really, um, it was a wonderful experience going. I would also say that people were very welcoming. I was invited into homes uh, and uh, treated with uh, traditional Iranian hospitality, which is, uh, for those who've experienced, they know that that is really uh, something to treasure. Uh, so I have to thank the Taliban for going to Iran. Not every day we hear somebody saying thank you to the Taliban. No, not every day. Um, since you brought them up, uh, you know, you mentioned that in the 1990s, the Iranian government was critical of the Taliban. Um, they joined the rest of the world in refusing to recognize the Taliban as the legitimate government of Afghanistan in the 90s. Um, and as we all know, the US war in Afghanistan ended chaotically last month. And the Iranian government has been discussing how to respond to the Taliban's return to power. And I've seen reports that some members of the leadership, like, I'm sorry, can you hear me? I'm sorry. Yes, I can. So I think okay. somebody just joined in. So oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there's been some reports that some members of the leadership, like members in the Iranian Revolutionary Guard, have suggested that this time around, Iran should try to work with the Taliban. Um, so I'm curious, what do you think Iran's response to the Taliban ultimately will be? And what do you think some of the implications will be of those kinds of policies, depending on how they choose to engage with the Taliban or to reject them. Yeah, you know, I think the Iranians were happy to see the United States kicked out, but I don't think they're happy with, with an all Taliban government. Um, Afghanistan has a large uh, Shia minority population, uh, primarily ethnic Hazara, and uh, the Iranians made it very clear that they wanted to see the Taliban create an inclusive, relatively inclusive government that would have some Shia representation, and that has not happened. Um, also, Iran is very worried because there are more refugees coming out, uh, many more refugees, and Iran already has several million, uh, many of them not registered with the UN, but uh, needless to say, they have a long and porous border with Afghanistan, and Iran is still under US uh, sanctions, its economy is not in good condition, and the last thing they need is more starving refugees pouring in from Afghanistan. So I think, I think they're, they're upset. Um, and it's, uh, they're, they're weighing their anti-Americanism against their concerns about what will happen in Afghanistan, what the economic impact will be in particular uh, on Iran. They're also worried about ISIS. Uh, you know, one of the reasons the Iranians established some sort of ties with the Taliban uh, some years ago was because they saw the rise of ISIS and they thought that the Taliban could be a buffer against ISIS-K, ISIS Khorasan. Um, and uh, so they still need to have some sort of uh, relationship with the Taliban, but most people are not happy about it. We've seen criticism already from some of the reformist uh, factions and press. You know, Iran now has a complete monopoly of power in the hands of the so-called hardliners, president, parliament, uh, obviously supreme leader, all of these various bodies controlled by these people, but the reformists still do have some newspapers. And so, You've seen various uh, snipes coming from editorial pages, also from the former foreign minister, Javad Zarif, has been tweeting. Um, we need to remember that Iran was the prime supporter of a group called the Northern Alliance uh, 20 years ago, and the United States actually piggybacked on uh, Iran's support for that group to get rid of the Taliban 20 years ago. Now the Northern Alliance is basically destroyed. All the old warlords are, have fled. Uh, some of them to Iran, some of them to Central Asia, and there's only the son of Ahmed Shah Massoud, uh, who has hired a Washington lobby shop <laughs> to try to support his case, but he doesn't have the, the troops, he doesn't have the territory that uh, the Northern Alliance had 20 years ago. So I think Iran is very ambivalent, and um, again, it's a pity that U.S.-Iran relations are in such a 
sad state because we could use Iranian intel about what's going on in Afghanistan now that we've been pushed out. And I'm not sure we're going to have uh, any access to that. Yeah, I, I often think that the United States and Iran, if they could just work things out, actually have a lot of interests aligned when it comes to international affairs. Um, you brought up the, the leadership of Iran. So I'd like to ask you about Iran's new president, Ibrahim Raisi, who recently took office. Many Iranians and international commenters argue that the presidential elections were rigged in favor of Raisi with the uh, Iranian government, the Council of Guardians, disqualifying pretty much any serious competition he had in that election, in particular, all of the reformist candidates. Uh, so Raisi is deeply conservative. He has a very troubling record on human rights. So what do you think the Raisi president mean, presidency means for Iran going forward? Well, it's definitely a, a setback for Iran's political development. Um, you know, I started going there just at the point when Iran was having mildly competitive uh, elections for president and parliament. Um, my first trip was when Rafsanjani was president. My second was when uh, Mohammad Hatemi was elected, and he was a surprise uh, victor uh, in, in elections in 1997. Uh, there was a regime favorite who... who lost in a very embarrassing uh, uh, manner. Hatemi appealed to young people and to women. He promised social reforms. He talked about a dialogue of civilizations with the West uh, and was a very appealing candidate for a lot of people who really wanted to see Iran change and no longer be this dreary revolutionary state. But unfortunately, um, you know, that experiment uh, faced a number of obstacles. I write a lot, a lot about it in my book. Some of the obstacles were internal, clearly, from the Revolutionary Guard, from the supreme leader of the country, uh, a Shia cleric who is very jealous of his power. Um, and some of it was a, as a result of uh, very bad policy decisions by the United States after the September 11 attacks when we had a major opportunity uh, to improve relations with Iran and George W. Bush in his infinite stupidity decided to put Iran on the so-called axis of evil with Iraq and North Korea, three countries that had nothing to do with 9-11. Um, and uh, you know, it's, it's, it's really, it's one of those great what ifs. What if we had worked with the Iranians and tried to improve relations with them after 9-11? Uh, you know, would reformists have become a stronger faction in the country? Instead, we got a man named Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in 2005 and, and his two terms followed by Rouhani, a pragmatist. Uh, and of course, we had the Iran nuclear deal, which came out of his presidency. Uh, but then Trump gets elected and pulls out of the deal. And now we have Raisi. Um, I call Raisi a kind of mini me for the Supreme Leader, Ayatollah Khamenei. Uh, he is really a flunky. I don't know that he has any ideas of his own. Uh, he was selected for this role, groomed for this role. His background comes uh, from the judiciary where he uh, is implicated in, in the summary execution of 5,000 political prisoners in the 1980s when he was a young, uh, young cleric. Uh, and he was also a very repressive judiciary chief before he became president. Uh, so he's not very appealing, not even to the Iranian people. Uh, the turnout in the election was the lowest it has been in 40 years. Um, and his support, he has barely the support of a quarter of the of registered voters, even of the 48% who, who, who participated, a number of them, um, put in spoiled or invalid ballots, uh, uh, something like another, uh, you know, uh, I forget whether it was another 10%. His, his percentage was very, very low. And this was after, as you pointed out, all of his viable uh, opponents had been disqualified and not allowed to run. So I would say it was one of the most staged managed elections in the history of the Islamic Republic. And as a result, he has no real base. He has the support of the Supreme Leader, which of course is tremendously important, and the Revolutionary Guard and so on. 
But if he doesn't start to rack up some successes in short order, um, he's going to become even more unpopular and his desire to succeed the Supreme Leader when the Supreme Leader dies, I think will become much more problematic. Uh, we just had a piece on the Atlantic Council website today on climate uh, challenges to Raisi. Uh, Iran is going through a dreadful uh, crisis, particularly with poor management of water resources. And um, issues like the environment um, are really going to uh, hurt him. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that, you know, judging from the people that are in his cabinet, that he has uh, competent people who are willing to take the tough decisions that are required, uh, you know, to deal with issues like climate. And of course, we have the nuclear question. Will they come back into the nuclear agreement? What will happen with sanctions? So he's, he's got a lot of challenges ahead of him. Yes, yeah, he certainly does. And I wonder if you could elaborate a bit on what you're hearing about the mood of the Iranian people right now. Um, you mentioned the environmental crisis and there were protests in Khuzestan province about water. Uh, they're, you know, they, they've been hit very hard by COVID. The US economic sanctions have been economically crippling. And then on top of it, as you mentioned, there are Afghan refugees coming in on top of the ones who are already there. Um, but the government seems to be responding to Iranian protests or Iranian complaints with violence. Um, they put down the water protests pretty decisively, just as they put down protests over the previous few years that have come up. So um, what do you think Iranians are feeling about the current situation? And, and you know, based on the fact that there are so many unhappy citizens with this very repressive government, where do you see that going? Not in a, a good direction. It's really hard to be optimistic right now about, uh, about the future of the country, at least in, in the short term. Uh, people are, are fed up, uh, they're uh, frustrated, cynical. Um, another advertisement on the 24th of September, we're having an event on Iranian public opinion, some polling that the University of Maryland is doing. Now, of course, you have to take poll results with a grain of salt in a country like Iran. Uh, where people may be afraid of, of, of speaking their minds. But we found over the years that actually you do get some indication uh, uh, from the trend lines of how people are feeling. So I think they're just, you know, they're very, very frustrated. And young people, of course, they're all trying to get out of the country. Um, professionals, anybody with skills uh, doing their best to to leave and, and, and it's not easy to do that. I mean, how many refugees can Western countries uh, take, especially with this exodus now from, from Afghanistan. Um, yeah, people, people focus on their personal lives. They're, they're doing their best just to take care of themselves and their families. Uh, and, uh, you know, the economic shocks, particularly since the reimposition of sanctions, um, the currency has collapsed, inflation is very high. Um, Iran has managed to sell some oil to the Chinese, a few other places. Uh, and you know, kept itself afloat. Um, it's doing a lot of import substitution, um, a lot of things actually that are very bad for the environment. I mean, it's growing crops that it shouldn't be growing, that it should be importing, but you know, it doesn't want to have to depend on on others. And it has a lot of uh, very inefficient industry uh, and very dirty industry. And you know, it should be um, it should be investing in. Uh, in renewables, it has plenty of sunshine, um, but a lot of the contracts that had been signed by European companies to help it with solar power and things like that, all of those contracts fell apart after uh, Trump left the, the Joint Comprehensive Plan of Action. So it's you know it's really going to be difficult for AC to uh, to see major improvements. It's one of the reasons why I think he will ultimately have to come back into the nuclear deal. Um, I think. Uh, even if the results are, are not uh, fantastic for Iran, still any relief of sanctions would, would be helpful in terms of, uh, you know, uh, stopping the decline in the economy. Great, thank you. Um, so I, I want to jump on that last topic that you brought up is the nuclear deal. Uh, there have been attempts at renegotiating a new deal between the US and Iran and, and the other countries involved, and they've been halting over the last several months. 
Um, so what do you think some of the key issues and considerations are for the United States and for Iran in the negotiations? And it sounds like you think that there will be a deal out of these negotiations. So could you talk a bit about where you think things are going to go with that? Yeah, it's very unfortunate that the deal was not restored while the previous government uh, was in, in power. But uh, the Iranian system actually slowed everything down to make sure that Raisi would get elected. They didn't want any, uh, any irrational enthusiasm among the Ira Iranian electorate that might help another candidate. Uh, and so they basically stopped the talks in June after six rounds. Um, the, the, the issue is not negotiating a new agreement. The issue is getting back into the old one. And frankly, if we didn't have the old one, which was finalized in 2015, I would be much more worried because I don't think the current administration in Iran is capable, frankly, of negotiating a, an entire new agreement. I mean, this is 150 pages, it's very complex. So the problem is how do you sequence uh, a return to compliance on the part of both Iran and the United States the U.S. has to lift a number of sanctions that were imposed that are inconsistent with the deal. Um, but there are some sanctions the U.S. may not lift, and of course the Iranians would like all of them lifted. That's not going to happen. The Iranians have blown way past the limits that were set on their nuclear program. Uh, they have 10, 20 times more enriched uranium than they're supposed to, enriched to much higher levels. They've put in new advanced centrifuges. They're enriching in locales where they are not supposed to be enriching. They have reduced their cooperation with the monitors from the International Atomic Energy Agency. So they have a number of steps that they have to take to get back into the deal. So the question is, how do you structure this so that the US does something, Iran does something, there's a date set for both sides to be back in and and you sequence uh, how this goes. Um, I don't think it's rocket science. I mean, I really think we ought to be able to do this. We have a very capable team, certainly on the US side. Uh, one of the problems though, is that the talks have been indirect. The Iranians say, well, the US quit the deal, so you're not entitled to sit in the same room with us, which means that all of these negotiations are going primarily via the Europeans, a little bit through the Russians and, and the Chinese. But, it makes it so much more cumbersome. Um, and, uh, you know, really, I mean, if Raisi wants a deal, if Hamenei, the Supreme Leader, wants to get back in, they should sit in the same room and get this done. The longer this goes on the way it is without talks, without a return, um, the less and less it's perceived, I think, as being in the interest of the United States because we have certain deadlines that were set under the deal that get closer and closer. Um, and um, there's more obviously sanctions busting. Our sanctions are less and less effective. The Iranians have found ways around it. Uh, so um, I really do think that time is not on our side here. Um, but hopefully, uh, you know, I'm hearing that perhaps uh, in early October, uh, talks may finally uh, resume. Let's, let's hope that they work it out. Um, so from what I understand, the Iranians have blown past the nuclear development agreement thresholds because the US withdrew under Trump from the agreement. Um, if the US and the Iranians can't work this out and they don't return to the agreement and Iran doesn't meet those deadlines, what do you think, what will happen then? Well, US will keep sanctions. It may try to enforce them a little bit more aggressively than the Biden administration has so far. Uh, the Europeans will probably uh, reimpose their sanctions, which they have not done right now. Um, I don't know that the UN will take action because probably Russia and China will protect Iran, but uh, it is possible that the UN Security Council will take up the issue again, which uh, you know, will make the Iranians very unhappy. Um, the IAEA, the International Atomic Energy Agency, may take uh, some steps as well, uh, might pass some resolutions. They just had a board meeting where they refrained from acting against Iran. But if this goes on and on, you know, there's some other outstanding issues. Uh, traces of enriched uranium at three sites in Iran that were not declared to the IAEA and 
Uh, the Iranians have not provided adequate access or explanation for those traces of uranium. Um, it could you know, blow up into another crisis with the IAEA. So there are other steps that, that can be taken that will increase pressure on Iran. And um, certainly the Iranian economy is not going to, uh, is not going to grow uh, at any uh, good pace if this standoff continues. Yeah, uh, so it, it sounds like it's really in Iran's interest to get back into the nuclear deal. But well, I yes, yes, except, I mean, in fairness to the Iranians, first of all, they are legitimately furious that the US pulled out the way it did when they were in compliance. And secondly, they're asking for some sort of assurances that that doesn't happen again. And that's a problem given our political system where we can't guarantee you know, that God forbid Donald Trump is not reelected in 2024 or another Republican who wants to pull out of the deal. I mean, if it were Mike Pompeo, I'm sure he would pull out of the deal if we were back in it. Uh, so the Iranians are looking for some sort of guarantees and I don't know how that can be done. The only thing I can think of is that maybe some kind of system could be set up whereby the US would be penalized by other countries somehow if it pulls out again without a legitimate reason. Um, you know, that's one possibility. Um, but, uh, but in terms of promising that the US government won't change, you know, this is an agreement that was based on executive orders. It's not a treaty. Uh, so that makes, it, uh, that makes it fragile. And there are also voices in Iran that are saying to hell with it, you know, let's keep on with this program. And maybe we should even get nuclear weapons because that's the only way we can guarantee that Israel and the United States and, or other countries will not attack us. Um, you know, it's worked for Pakistan. Uh, why shouldn't it work? It's worked for Israel. Why shouldn't it work for Iran, you know? Uh, and uh, I mean, Iran is a member of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. So it would have to withdraw from that treaty first if it were going to go down that route. And of course, uh, there would be the possibility of military action. The Israelis certainly have made no secret of their willingness to do that, although I think they would need help from the United States in that event. But we could continue this sort of colossal game of chicken. Um, and of course, there would be instability, not just in Iran or around Iran, but in Iraq and other places where Americans are, are stationed and where they're extremely vulnerable to attack from Iran-backed groups, as we have seen uh, in the past, particularly in Iraq. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, all of your points about Iranians uh, feeling betrayed by the, the previous agreement, uh, they're certainly valid, uh, but it does create a really complicated situation, as you've just explained. Um, so I, I want to thank you for those excellent answers, and I'm sure that our audience has a lot of questions for you. So I'm going to open the floor to audience Q&A. Uh, and so if you have a question for Ms. Slavin, please either type your question in the chat box and I'll read it out, or you could use the raise hand function on Zoom and I will call on you to ask your question. Um, so again, we ask that you keep your microphone on mute unless I call on you, but, um, you know, please start, feel free to start uh, asking your questions and we'll do our best to field them as they come in. Yeah. Okay, uh, Frank, uh, do you wanna no, unmute yourself? I, I wrote this on chat, but since nobody raised his hand, I thought I'd raise my hand. Hi, Barbara. Good to Hi, see Frank, you. nice to see you. Um, the argument has been advanced that the new JCPOA or whatever we're going to call it should not just cover nuclear issues, but missile issues as well, and maybe support of militias and that sort of thing. How far are the Iranians ready, willing to go to expand the JCPOA to include these other issues? Mm -hmm. Well, the the uh, Biden administration has talked about negotiating something that is longer and stronger. I think that might be possible just in the nuclear realm. Uh, if the US were to put uh, more sanctions relief on the table, for example, uh, go after some of the primary US sanctions like our unwillingness to let uh, Iran uh, 
uh, have any access to the US dollar through the international financial system. Uh, but in terms of missiles um, and Iran's uh, <clears throat> regional posture, uh, it's a non-starter. Um, this is how Iran defends itself in the absence of being a nuclear weapons state. Uh, it's through its missiles um, and through its relationships with groups like Hezbollah and militias uh, in, in Iraq. And uh, that's how it deters attacks on its homeland. So it's just, it's not gonna give that up. What it might do is engage in some conversations with uh, regional uh, partners on confidence building measures and the United States could certainly support uh, talks like that. Uh, we've already seen uh, a meeting that was in Baghdad recently with some of the key regional players. Um, certainly the Iranians and the Saudis are talking to each other and it would be very helpful if they could reach some agreements to stop supporting uh, subversion uh, and attacks on each other. Um, so I don't know, I don't think we're gonna see a huge conference kind of thing. I mean, I think that's too unwieldy and uh, also Iran's Arab neighbors can't even agree among themselves, frankly, about very much, but we may see some limited configurations and certainly some bilateral talks that could reduce tensions on, on these issues, but it won't be part of a new JCPOA, I don't think. Great, and um, Edward, did you raise your hand? Uh, no, I, I didn't raise my hand, but I had, a, I had a very similar question to Frank, and you've answered that thoroughly. Um, the a question that I would have is about uh, the uh, Iran, Iran's stance towards Israel, and is there argument or debate or with Israel actually associated with the uh, Palestinian resolution, uh, associated with the Palestinian state, or is that just for public consumption? Mm -hmm. Actually, really what, what, is, what is behind that antagonism? Yeah, that's a really, really good question. You know, uh, the revolution 40 years ago, um, it was supposed to be about more than just getting rid of the Shah of Iran. It was supposed to be this great sort of uh, Islamo-leftist, uh, you know, identification with the downtrodden throughout the world. Uh, and of course, the Palestinian cause was a very big issue uh, back then, perhaps more so, frankly, than it is now. Certainly, it was, it was the most important issue for most Muslim countries uh, and certainly for Arab countries. And so one way in which Ayatollah Khomeini, the leader of the revolution, sought to portray his revolution as pan-Islamic and going beyond the Shia minority uh, religion was by latching on to the Palestinian cause. And uh, Yasser Arafat famously was the first foreign leader, important foreign guest, uh, to come to Iran uh, after the, the revolution. Um, but Arafat then proceeded to support Saddam Hussein in the Iran-Iraq war. <laughs> so that, that kind of fell apart. Then Iran found a new partner in a group called Hamas, which was uh, Islamic fundamentalist, Sunni Islamic fundamentalist, but nevertheless uh, uh, associated with the Muslim Brotherhood, which has always had um, a relationship with Iran really since the, the Iranian revolution, you know, political Islam, being common to both of them. Um, but as you may remember in the 1980s, um, Israel was not, I mean, there was anti-Israel rhetoric, but Israel was providing Iran with weapons to use against Iraq and getting the United States involved in the Iran-Contra scandal and getting us to provide uh, weapons and spare parts to Iran because Saddam Hussein was seen as a bigger threat by the Israelis during the 1980s. Then in the 90s, that changed, particularly after the 1991 Gulf War, when, when Saddam was crushed and put under sanctions, the Israelis said, well, we don't have to worry about Iraq anymore, but gee, what about Iran? And they noticed that Iran was supporting Hamas uh, and that Iran was supporting Hezbollah in Lebanon, which had become very anti-Israeli as well. And so that's in the early 90s when we start to see Israel and Iran truly become enemies. 
And it's basically stayed like that ever since. I mean, the Israelis assassinate Iranian scientists and the Iranians support groups that carry out acts of terrorism in Israel. The Iranians also supported acts of terrorism against, uh, against Jews in, uh, in places like Argentina, you may remember. Um, and so, I mean, Bibi Netanyahu starting in the early 90s, but not just Bibi, was saying that Iran would get the nuclear bomb, you know, every year. I mean, he said it practically starting in about 1994. Um, the average Iranian, frankly, could care less about the Palestinian question uh, and finds the support for, for groups like Hamas and Hezbollah uh, and Assad in Syria to a colossal waste of Iran's limited resources. Uh, but it's part of the ideology of the regime. And there is the great Satan, which is the United States, and there is the lesser Satan, which is Israel. Um, and, you know, this, the antagonism has waxed and waned under Hatami in the late 90s, early 2000s. Uh, Hatami said that Iran would accept any, any settlement that the Palestinians would, for example. Uh, but under Ahmadinejad, there were conferences in Iran denying the Holocaust. Uh, um, and, uh, you know, death to Israel became a big slogan again. And now with this lot, um, Raisi and company, we will see a lot of antagonism toward Israel again. Um, but as I mentioned, it's a two-way street. I mean, the Israelis have, have killed six, seven Iranian nuclear scientists, most recently, just last uh, December before, be, before Joe Biden was inaugurated. And it was after that, that the Iranians uh, really accelerated their nuclear program. The parliament passed a law uh, demanding that Iran start enriching to higher and higher levels just to show that you can kill our scientists, but it's not going to hold back uh, our program. It's a very, it's a very destructive and counterproductive uh, rivalry. And, um, you know, whatever one could do to tamp that down really would be, would be great. But uh, nobody has any uh, any brilliant solutions that, that I'm aware of. Instead, what we see is Israel forming alliances with more Arab states against Iran. I mean, the Abrahamic Accords is all about containing Iran and confronting Iran. Um, uh, you know, look at the countries, uh, particularly UAE and, and Bahrain that have gotten themselves involved in this. Hey, thank you. So um, Ali Sultani, you've been waiting to ask your question. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Barbara, thank you for the very insightful presentation. Really appreciate it. So my question is on the U.S. sanctions. And uh, what, what I'm curious about is uh, every once in a while we hear that uh, U.S. turns the vice a little bit more and a little bit more and then a little bit more. So the question is, how many more turns of this vice are left in your opinion? And is it even meaningful anymore? Yeah. You know, as I mentioned, the only thing the U.S. could do is maybe go after some big Chinese companies that are importing oil from, from Iran or companies in Malaysia that are acting as go-betweens for oil shipments uh, to, to Iran. The, the, literally everything that can be sanctioned has been sanctioned uh, pretty much. And, and what's happened is that, you know, we have diminishing returns because Iranians find ways around it. The sanctions hurt ordinary people and they benefit the smugglers of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps uh, who are making tons of money. And one reason why I worry about whether they'll want to get back into the JCPOA is that they're, they're people who make money off this, make money off sanctions. And if Iran goes back into the deal and the sanctions are eased, they won't make that money anymore. Um, so, you know, it, it, it's a trap. And, I mean, I look at all the countries we've sanctioned and, and in every case there has not, I can't think of one with the exception of South Africa, which was very special. You had the entire world behind that. But if you look at unilateral US sanctions, um, North Korea, Cuba, Venezuela, I mean, it never works. These countries do not change. Um, and um, well, one other small exception, maybe Libya, yeah. Uh, at least initially there was a change by Muammar Gaddafi, but then of course Gaddafi was overthrown, so it didn't last. Um, but by and large, it doesn't work. It embitters people. It 
causes real harm. I mean, in Iraq in the 90s, a half a million children died from, from starvation and from uh, preventable childhood illnesses because of sanctions. You know, I mean, why? What were we, what, how was that was supposed to, you know? And in the end, Saddam Hussein was still there and it took a full scale US invasion to get rid of him. So I, I really think that sanctions, I've called them sadism masquerading as foreign policy. I think they're terrible. And in, I, I, I really wish we could just get rid of almost all of them. Pinpoint them on a few individuals that are human rights abusers or proliferators but do not put sanctions on an entire country and certainly not on the main, um, the main uh, economic engines of entire countries because all you get is misery as a result and lots and lots of corruption and smuggling. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And I, you know, I completely agree with you about sanctions and the Iranian people have been through enough, right? <laughs> it's just- no, And you know, yeah. COVID, I mean, in yeah. the midst of the COVID pandemic and we still have these sanctions, it's yeah. just so inhumane. Absolutely. Um, okay, so uh, BJ Amini, you've been patiently waiting to ask your question. You need to unmute yourself though. Can't hear, yeah. Click the button. There you go. There. All right, uh, I want to thank Barbara uh, for her wonderful presentation. And I just want to, um, endorse some of the things that you said. I was in Iran when Arafat arrived. And oh, he, wow. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it was just mind blowing because he goes to Friday prayers and he's in the major mosque and he's looking there and all of this is being shown on television. Sure. And he goes, when I look at Tehran, I see Jerusalem. And all of my friends were looking at each other, you know, and never in our wildest dreams did we think Jerusalem was going to be the word that came out of his mouth. Yeah. And then um, where I lived was not far from the Sadabad Palace, which was the palace that the Shah's sister, Princess Ashraf, lived in. Of course, they had all fled and everything, but it came the training ground for... Um, some of the um, um, irregular soldiers. The so all of Arafat, yeah. Arafat's troops came in and Arafat's troops were the trainers mm -hmm. of, these, of the guards. And so they were isolated and put up at Sadabad Palace so people wouldn't really understand that they were there. And that those two stories I know for a, that were actually true. This other story that I'm going to tell is something that was reported in reputable sources and books that I have read since I left Iran, is that, um, well, all of these women that were, you know, loved Khomeini and they were ready to give their life for him. And these were little old ladies from the village and they had nothing, they owned nothing, but they would take off their one or two gold bagels that they had and put them in a chest. And Arafat departed Iran after that first visit with $800 million worth of gold. Wow, wow. Can I ask what you were doing in Iran at the time? Well, I was married to a Persian. <laughs> ah, okay, I wondered at the last name, so yeah. yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Um, yeah, that's a great story. I mean, if you go back, it goes back further, actually. It goes back to Lebanon in the well, 70s. When, it goes um, back to, in my opinion, to Kissinger yeah. and Nixon, when they are the ones that sold all this nuclear technology to Iran. And it goes yeah, back too. to Harvard and MIT, who made <laughs> arrangements the Shah of Iran endowed all of these chairs and yeah, yeah. sent the top brightest and the best Iranian people to yeah. get nuclear engineering degrees in the United States, which they did, okay? And yeah. then they returned to Iran and they are the core of the people that are doing this now. They were trained in the, and the MIT and Harvard and all of these other places that took them, they were just, I mean, bated breath. They couldn't wait. The, sure. It was hot 
hundreds of millions of dollars. Will somebody please, please? Yeah, yeah. no, you're Let's, right. You're right. The U.S. gave it Iran out of context. The U.S. gave Iran its first nuclear reactor in the 1960s, uh, a research reactor. Oh, atoms for peace. Yeah. I yeah. Right. But the first reactor went in the 60s under Lyndon Johnson, and it's still churning out medical isotopes uh, right. to this day. And of course, Ali Salehi was an MIT grad, and he was head of the uh, Iranian Atomic Energy Organization and helped actually negotiate the nuclear deal with uh, our energy secretary, Ernie Moniz, who was also from MIT. Um, right. And that they had, you know, they had a, a rapport which really uh, helped in, in, in doing that. But in terms just of the Palestinian issue, um, there were uh, opponents of the Shah in the 70s who went to Lebanon and trained with the PLO, right. which of course was in Lebanon at the time. And, um, and then after the revolution, of course, um, you know, some, uh, some of these people, Iranians who had been trained by the PLO came back to Iran and they actually created the Revolutionary Guards, the Islamic Revolutionary Guard Corps. There was also an association with a group called Amal, uh, which was a Shia, Lebanese Shia organization, very left wing, uh, that was actually started by a representative of the Shah, a cleric named the Imam Musa Sadr, who went to Lebanon to uplift the downtrodden Shia of Lebanon. And from this relationship came Hezbollah after the Israelis invaded Lebanon in 1982. A thousand revolutionary guards came from Iran to the Beka Valley and helped the Lebanese Shia form their own militia, which became Hezbollah. So there are a lot of connections, uh, you know, certainly with Arab Shia, we see that in Iraq, um, but also with Sunni organizations that were involved with the, the Palestinian cause. So it goes with that. that. And of course, you I know, thought, the, sorry? It was main, I mean, um, those things mainly started as being anti-Shah? Yeah, it was anti, on the Iranian side, it was anti-Shah. And of course, um, the Palestinians, the PLO was anti-Shah because the Shah and the Israelis were like this, right? Uh -huh. So, right. you know, you have the same enemies. Right. Uh, at that time, and they were also very anti-American. These these forces at the same time, so it made it made a good deal of sense back then. Perhaps I don't know how much sense it makes now when the Arab world has largely moved on, frankly, from the Palestinians, and uh, when uh, you know, I mean, Hamas is only entrenched in Gaza. But you know, the Iranians are loyal to their their old buddies. Look at Syria. I mean, the way they have stuck with the Assad regime, despite its horrendous human rights abuses, is a function of the fact that in 1980, when Saddam Hussein attacked Iran, uh, Syria, uh, which had a rival wing of the Ba'ath Party uh, and hated Iraq, hated Saddam, was the only major Arab state to side with Iran. And so Iran is, you know, is paying back that favor. The Assads have always been uh, on Iran's side, and so Iran is on Assad's side, uh, despite all the atrocities that that have taken place. Um, the other thing, you know, you mentioned Jerusalem. Of course, the Quds force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard. This is the elite force, uh, kind of like their special forces and CIA, the the the, the which liaises with foreign organizations, which. Uh, carries out uh, acts of various militancy and whatnot abroad, Quds is Jerusalem in Arabic. So it's the Jerusalem force of the Iranian Revolutionary Guard Corps. Jerusalem has resonance for all Muslims, third holiest site in Islam, uh, apart from the, the Palestinian cause. Um, so it's very hard to, you know, for Iran to, to give this up. Uh, as much as, you know, the vast majority of the people probably, you know, would wish that they would. Um, you know, there's, there, are, there are a lot of Iranian Jews who emigrated to Israel. And uh, they, they see their relatives, you know, they meet in Cyprus and Turkey and places like that for family reunions. There's, a, there's a, I think, a voice of Israel uh, service in, in Farsi and Persian 
that's directed against uh, Iran. And uh, there's still Jews who live in Iran, not that many anymore, maybe about 10,000 or so. Um, but, you know, th there have been Jews in Iran for 5,000 years. So um, there are connections on a people to people level, but politically, they just are at each other's throats. And, you know, it's a great shame. Great, thank you. Um, so Ali has another question. Sure. Barbara, I think early in the show, uh, you were commenting about the low uh, votes that Raisi received and uh, also mention of uh, uh, some either corrupted votes or votes that were not good. Uh, yeah. Which kind of prompted this question in my mind on, uh, do these kind of uh, uh, in some way uh, reflect a level of transparency and therefore legitimacy of the process? Can you comment on that? Well, yeah, you know, it's interesting because in, in 2009, there were, there were allegations of serious fraud. Uh, you know, Ahmadi Najad won a second term, but most people think he didn't, <laughs> and that they simply, you know, threw away ballots, stuffed ballots, whatever. Um, this time, you know, it's possible, frankly, that the numbers that Raisi got were even lower, uh, <laughs> but they had to, they had to make it, you know, at least a little bit credible, so that they at least didn't pretend that he had, uh, you know, majority support. I mean, he got 60% of the votes cast, they said, but only 48% of the of registered voters voted according to the government. And as I mentioned, a number of those votes, I mean, there were people who voted for, you know, Batman and, you know, put in a ballot, but it was a spoiled ballot. So it's it's entirely likely frankly that that his vote vote count was even lower than what they said i think they said he got about 17 million votes um out of 48 million people who voted um and uh that was about what he got in 2017 when he ran against rohani and he lost uh so it's a pretty pathetic showing even if he really did get 17 million votes thank you Hey, um, so Edward has his hand up. Uh, yes, yeah, so I've got another question. Earlier in your presentation, you mentioned uh, poll, uh, questionability of polling in Iran itself. So do you have any information on how do you uh, accomplish polling in Iran? And yeah. uh, you know, to what extent is it? You've already indicated that you know, it's questionable validity, but how, how, much, can you, how much can you trust it? Well, I invite you to tune in on uh, September 24th on Friday at noon uh, when we will have a program on this very issue and the people who do the polls will explain um, will explain uh, themselves. Um, they, they've been doing this for a long time. So they say that you can look at the trend lines and that gives you an indication. Now there are certain questions they can't ask. They can't ask people whether they support the supreme leader of the country. That's a no-no. Um, but they can ask uh, how popular is Raisi versus, you know, three or four other well-known Iranians, for example. Uh, they can ask uh, about what people think is the reason for the economic problems that Iran faces. And interestingly, in the past, people have always said that corruption was a bigger factor than sanctions corruption and mismanagement. So I'll be interested to see if they say that yet again. They will give opinions about, um, about what they think of other foreign countries apart from the United States, Russia, China, neighbors, Afghanistan, perhaps they'll be asked about what they think about the Taliban. Um, so even if it's not you know, rock solid, I mean, these are telephone, they're done by telephone. Uh, people don't have to give their names. Um, and uh, I am told that, you know, and this has certainly been my experience when I've gone to Iran as a journalist, people have not been shy <laughs> about voicing their opinions. Um, sometimes they say the most amazing things to you. And so I would think that a lot of people will actually, you know, especially now when they're so fed up uh, with everything, that they actually will be fairly candid. You know, it's just, it's a question of, how the, the questions are phrased, and also the fact that you can ask questions like, do you support the Supreme Leader? 
do you support the, the, the system in Iran whereby a, a, a cleric has the final say on, on all policies? You can't ask that question, but you can ask a lot of other stuff. Hey, um, so we do have time for another couple of questions. Uh, so if you have questions, and I'm especially going to call out if any of the FAU students in attendance want to ask a question, now is the time to do it. Okay, Frank, go ahead. Well, if nobody else has a question, I'll ask my second. Sure. And that is, I wonder if you could uh, further discuss Iran's goals in Syria? Is it just to support Assad because his family was nice, uh, his father was nice to the Iranians in the old days? What do they hope to accomplish? Yeah, well, it's partly loyalty, but it's also Hezbollah. You know, now, especially with Iraq, which we gave Iran when we got rid of Saddam, let's be honest, Iran now has a land bridge all the way through to Lebanon. Uh, it has the Shia Crescent that uh, King Abdullah of Jordan warned about years ago. Uh, and so as long as it has a good relationship with Assad, it can move its people and weapons and whatnot um, through Iraq and then through Syria and then directly uh, in, into Lebanon. So it's a very valuable real estate. I think the other thing is that Iran hopes to eventually get a piece of re the reconstruction of Syria. I mean, at some point, most likely the international community will give up on, on regime change in Syria since Assad has survived all of this horribleness for the last decade. And uh, Syria will be back in the Arab League and the sanctions, a lot of them will be lifted. And Iran hopes to benefit from that, hopes that, you know, that Syria will have money again that it can spend on, um, on reconstruction. So I think those are the, the two things. Iran has also tried periodically to put missile factories in, in Syria, but the Israelis are extremely good at finding them and blowing them up. Um, so, you know, it's another, it, it's another place where this, this sort of proxy war can, can go on um, and, uh, and the Iranians can, can uh, irritate the Israelis and, and vice versa. Um, uh, and it saves Lebanon, which is God knows in bad enough shape already from being the, the venue for, for another war. They can, you know, they can use Syria, which is already fairly destroyed. Um, I have to say that the places where Iran is strong are, are largely failed or failing states, which is not a, a good commentary on uh, an alliance with Iran. Uh, it, uh, it doesn't seem to get you to uh, prosperity and, and, and happiness. Uh, but Iran has exploited power vacuums where it's found them, uh, and it's made a virtue out of uh, the missteps of uh, the United States in particular, the Saudis and the Israelis. So they took the Israeli invasion and got Hezbollah. Uh, they took our invasion of Iraq and they got Shia in charge of Iraq and all those militia groups. And they took the Saudi uh, uh, war against Yemen and they got an alliance with the Houthis. Um, you know, I think, I think we're batting zero uh, when it comes to preventing Iran from uh, creating these relationships and building on these relationships. Uh, and Iran is seen as reliable. And uh, Lord knows the United States is not. Can I jump in on that? I want to ask a follow-up question. I think a lot of Americans look at Iran's government and they remember the hostage crisis of the 70s and they put that vision of Iran on their interpretation of Iran's behavior internationally. Mm -hmm. and to me, it often seems like Iran is acting in the region much like other countries do. You know, it gets involved in conflicts in neighboring states. It's it's playing the, the chess game of power politics. Um, it looks like it's trying to be more than a regional power with the recent attempt to send its ships across the Atlantic that of course yeah. didn't work out, but these seem to be things that states tend to do. So could you, could you comment a bit about that? Do you, do you see yeah. Iran acting like other states or do you think there's something special about its foreign policy? Well, Iran is the biggest country in the region and it was an empire and uh, it has a certain sense of itself. And many of these policies really, you know, like the nuclear program, as was pointed out, go back to the Shah. 
uh, who had a very, uh, a very expansive view. And, and of course, we used him as our policeman in the Gulf. He sent troops to Oman to put down a rebellion. He seized three islands in the Persian Gulf that the United Arab Emirates also claimed, and Iran still has those three islands. Um, he claimed Bahrain at one point when the Brits were, were withdrawing from uh, the Persian Gulf in, in the early 1970s. So there's actually a continuity in terms of these hegemonistic uh, actions. Uh, and then there are smaller countries in the region like the United Arab Emirates. Remember, we used to call it Little Sparta that was intervening all over the place and supporting a lot of really horrible actors like uh, Hiftar in, uh, in Libya and uh, getting involved in Yemen, of course, um, and Eritrea and Lord knows where else. Um, and, uh, and the Saudis, certainly, uh, with their horrible war in Yemen, their blockading of Qatar, uh, their um, kidnapping, uh, or not kidnapping, but uh, ass assassination of Jamal Khashoggi, luring him to the consulate in Istanbul and, and then chopping him up, putting uh, Saudi businessmen in the Ritz-Carlton Hotel trying to uh, hold the Prime Minister of, of Lebanon as a hostage. I mean, nobody's hands are clean in, in that part of the world. It's just that some countries have traditionally been allied with the United States, so they get more of a pass than Iran does, uh, because Iran chants death to US and death to Israel, and is uh, associated with groups that the United States has on its terrorism list. Um, if Iran were to drop those groups and, and, and drop its over hostility toward the United States, then uh, you know, everything would be different. Um, but in terms of policies, really, I mean, not that different. It's, it's maybe a question of skill and scale uh, that Iran has been more successful in its interventions than a lot of these other countries have. Um, but, uh, but definitely, I mean, you know, it, it drives me crazy, you know, the countries like the Emirates, which have bought uh, support in Washington, have just dumped money on, on lobby groups and think tanks uh, and whatnot in, in DC. And so it has bought support, but it is a repressive little country. And there's just a story recently that they've been hiring US uh, cyber experts uh, to, to go after their opponents and, and uh, get hacking tools and whatnot, you know, but they get a pass, right? They get a pass because, uh, because uh, they have, uh, they have uh, bought and paid for much of Washington DC. It's very unfortunate. Yeah, and Iran Ukraine. can't do that. It's illegal. Right. You know, people on Twitter accuse me of being a, an agent of the regime, you know, like, like, yeah, alas, alack, you know, I can't, they can't buy support in this, you know, and we do it for our own, our, our own reasons uh, of principle, whatever they may be, certainly not because we are paid agents of Tehran, you know, but you can't say that about a lot of other people who yeah. are, uh, who are uh, working on the Middle East, unfortunately, in this country. Absolutely. Um, and just as a reminder, the UAE was one of three countries, along with Saudi Arabia and Pakistan, to recognize the Taliban in the 90s as a legitimate government. And all three are U.S. allies. So, and now we have the Abraham Accords, which, which was a major, I mean, if you make peace with Israel, you can get away with a lot in, in the United States. I mean, that is, look at, look at Sisi, look at Egypt, you know, um, that's just a fact of life. And uh, if Iran were smart, it would jump on board, but it's, it's committed to, to its resistance. And, uh, and so, you know, it's made its bed and it has to lie in it. Yeah, great, thank you. Um, so VJ has another question. You have to unmute yourself. I'm sorry, Iran, the Hutus and um, Yemen. Yemen? Yes, Yemen with the uh, Iran's support of the Hutus and how that impacts their relationship with Saudi Arabia and the United States. Yeah, this is a this is again opportunistic. Iran had a sort of relationship with the Houthis. They're a, they're a vaguely Shia uh, sect 
a uh, very old uh, sect in, uh, in Yemen and have been in charge of the government at various times, um, allied with the Saudis at one point in history. And the form of Shia Islam that they practice is actually closer to Sunni Islam than it is to the kind of Shiism Iranians practice. But the, uh, the Houthis uh, started a rebellion and uh, they got, most of their weapons really had belonged to the Yemeni army um, and, uh, and they got those weapons. But then the Saudis under Mohammed bin Salman, that great strategic thinker, decided that they were very worried that the Houthis were taking too much territory, that they're gonna take over all of Yemen. And so they intervened in, I guess it was 2015, uh, Mohammed bin Salman was the defense secretary, then it was before he was crown prince. And they started bombing the crap out of Yemen, which is one of the poorest countries on earth anyway, using their American planes with American logistical support. And the Houthis asked the Iranians for help. And the Iranians said, oh, gee, I guess we could do this because bin Salman had already picked a, and his father, Sultan, had already picked a fight with the Iranians by um, executing a very prominent uh, Saudi Shia leader, uh, Sheikh Nimr, right after um, uh, Sultan became the, the king, after Abdullah died. And then there, the Saudi embassy in Tehran was trash and they broke diplomatic relations. It was this big rift. So the Saudis saw an opportunity and said, hey, Houthis, you want some rockets, you want some drones, you want some cruise missiles, whatever. And they started providing weaponry to the Houthis. And the Houthis have used these rockets to hit targets in Saudi Arabia. They've hit airports, they've killed civilians. Um, and of course, they're retaliating for the Saudi bombing of Yemen. Um, but Iran is involved. I mean, not hugely, you know, frankly, I don't think the Iranians could stop the Houthis from fighting uh, if they wanted to. They could stop providing material, but the Houthis have plenty. Uh, I don't know that they need support from, from Iran anymore. They probably already learned how to make these rockets and whatnot on their, on their own. Um, but it's another example of a mis huge miscalculation on the part of one of Iran's rivals, in this case, Mohammed bin Salman. Um, he also started a blockade of Qatar, which forced Qatar into the arms of the Iranians because they needed to use Iranian airspace just to get flights in and out. I mean, again, how stupid. Qatar was traditionally had, had a reasonable relationship with Iran, but was not close to it. And now Qatar is closer to Iran as a result of that, that very, very stupid blockade. Um, so, you know, if the, if the rest of the world keeps making these, these terrible strategic blunders, we can't expect Iran just to sit there and not profit. That's what they do. Uh, I can't hear you. I'm sorry, you're muted again. Still muted. You have yeah. To, you All go. right. So um, I lived in South Yemen in Aden for three and a half years. My husband was with World Health Organization and we moved around a lot. But wow. South Yemen at that time was basically controlled by the Soviets. I mean, it was under Soviet control. After we left, the two Yemens united. So are the Houthis basically from South Yemen? Or no, are they're they north. They're from the they're north. north. Yeah. They're they're from the north. Well, all the Yemenis that I ever heard of hated the Saudis. <laughs> no, well, you know, the Yemenis do a lot of, have traditionally done a lot of menial work in Saudi Arabia. And we know how the Saudis treat uh, their construction workers and their janitors and yeah. So I wouldn't be, I mean, the Saudis have long discriminated against the Yemenis. So I wouldn't be surprised. Okay, so uh, when we were there, there was sort of like an undelineated border between the Yemens and Saudi Arabia, and there was the whole oil issue. I mean, there was a fear that they were, the Yemenis were sucking out Saudi oil. And what is it, a, was it a proxy war between the Soviet Union and the United States, or was it a proxy war between Iran and the um, Saudi Arabia or? Yeah, you know, I, 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 I have to confess a little bit of, of ignorance there. I know that South Yemen was leftist uh, and was, uh, was involved with the Soviet Union. I mean, this was still during the Cold War. 
when all of these places had to choose sides, whether they were pro-American or pro-Soviet. Yeah. Um, uh, and uh, Ali Abdullah Saleh, who was a leader from North. the North, right, right. Um, eventually was able to consolidate uh, power over, over the whole country after, certainly after the fall of, uh, after the collapse of the, the Soviet Union. And it was the same Ali Abdullah Saleh who had a falling out with other factions and wound up throwing in his lot with the Houthis um, uh, uh -huh. uh, back in 2014, 2015. Uh, so, you know, there's been a lot of opportunistic changing of sides. I mean, there are big divisions in Yemen. Southerners really want their own country again, a lot of them. There's also an Al Qaeda branch, big one uh, in, in, uh, in Yemen. And, and um, you know, I wrote actually a story about this years ago. The U.S. CIA actually had a an intelligence relationship with the Houthis uh, before um, before the Saudis uh, started attacking the country. And of course, we've lost that relationship now with the Houthis, who perceive the United States as the enemy because of our affiliation with uh, with the Saudis. Oh. Although we have stopped uh, actively supporting the Saudi war. Um, in Yemen, thankfully, um, you know it's it's a complicated country and it's a complicated uh, uh, war. I I do know that the Saudi uh, anointed leader uh, of Yemen, a guy named Hadi, is very unpopular. He lives in Riyadh. He doesn't even he's not even in in Aden. And the UAE has pretty much washed its hands of of that conflict. They've given it up too because it's just you know going on and on without a, a resolution. Okay, hey, we have time for one more audience question. If anybody has any last questions for uh, Barbara here. No, okay. Um, well, then I would like to ask a final question. It's actually two-parter. Um, what do you think is one thing that most Americans get wrong about Iran? And what do you think is one thing that most Americans don't know about Iran that they should? Well, there's a lot that they don't know. Um, I think I think most Americans don't know very much about uh, the Iranian people, uh, and that they, um, at least historically, have been very pro-American, and that they're very oriented toward the West, toward the United States and and Europe. Um, that Iran is forced now to rely on China uh, because of U.S. sanctions, primarily. Um, and because of our, our mistake in leaving the Iran nuclear deal. The other thing surprisingly Americans don't know, there was a poll taken recently and something like 60% of Americans think Iran has nuclear weapons and it doesn't. Israel has nuclear weapons and most Americans don't seem to know that but Iran doesn't. Um, I think also most Americans don't understand all of, I mean, they know the things Iran has done to us. They know about the hostage crisis, many, but they don't know that the US uh, overthrew the Iranian prime minister Mossadegh in 1953 and put the Shah back on the throne. They don't know that the US shot down an Iranian airliner in 1988 and killed 290 civilians. They don't know that the US supported Iraq during the Iran-Iraq war um, and, uh, you know, which killed a quarter of a million Iranians. So I think, you know, Iran has done a lot to us and has, has been responsible for many horrific acts. Um, but the US is not blameless and there needs to be a kind of, um, you know, mutual reconciliation and mutual forgiveness. We have to sit down and say, you know, I'm sorry for this, I'm sorry for that. We have to somehow put the past behind us and try to work together. And it's just so hard. You know, we had some efforts, Madeleine Albright gave a speech, I think it was in 2000, where she apologized for US support for, for Iraq, for example. Um, you know, and Hatami came close to expressing regret for the hostage crisis, sort of, kind of. Um, we need to be able to do that. We need to be able to put it behind us and, and find the areas of common ground uh, that do exist and, and try to focus on those things because otherwise, you know, we're, we're both losers. U.S. military is bogged down in the Persian Gulf. Why? Because of Iran. Why do we have to be there? Really? 
Uh, and uh, Iran certainly has not been as successful a country as it could have been because of its lack of access to the US economy and to the dollar. So we ought to be able to work on this. And uh, if anybody has any bright ideas, Hal, let me know, because frankly, sometimes I just want to tear my hair out. You know, I think we're getting somewhere and then we go right back down again. Yeah, thank you. Um, as somebody who's working on the history of US Iran relations with Iran in the first half of the 20th century, there's so many stories of like friendship and potential and it all went awry. <laughs> so I, I share your frustration. Um, so I want to thank you, Barbara, for such an engaging conversation and um, to commend you on just how impressive your broad knowledge is of the region and of the history. Uh, I'm sure the audience learned a lot. I want to thank everyone who has attended tonight. Um, and if you're interested in learning more about the Middle East, first, you should definitely go to the Atlantic Council's website and go to their programming, which will just help build on, on some of the things that we've done tonight and, and get into other areas that are also important. Um, follow Barbara on Twitter. Uh, I have to say of the Iran commenters, I think she's the one who gets things right most of the time compared to the others. Um, so I'm a big fan. Um, and then we also will be doing programming throughout the year through the Chastain Johnston Middle East Studies Lecture Series at FAU. Our next event will be a Zoom event on October 25th, featuring Professor Salim Yacoub from the University of California, Santa Barbara. And he'll be talking about his research on US relations with the Arab Middle East in the 1970s, with a particular focus on the question of oil. So um, keep an, event, uh, uh, an eye out for the event information on the Chastain Johnston and Peace, Justice and Human Rights Initiative websites on FAU's website, um, or you can contact me for more information and I have put my email address in the chat. Um, so thank you again, a big round of applause for our speaker and have a great night. Thank you, thanks for asking.